Thanks to NordVPN for supporting my channel. I blew up my hair today and now my arm is tired. And so I thought that I would answer your Q&A questions that you submitted about two months ago and that I meant to get to before the new year. So let's dive in. I'd love to hear your ideas for identifying bias in AI-driven systems. Some models do post their biases. However, there seems to be no standard in this regard. What efforts do industry have to take to tackle this issue? That's an interesting question. I guess I would be actually somewhat surprised if industry ended up setting the standards for bias in particular. And I say that only because so much of the research on this front is really coming out of academia. It is typical that industry or capitalist systems would, would set these types of standards for the larger public. But I don't know, I guess I'd worry a little bit about the standards that industry would set just because of the incentives involved in that. But I also know that the current status of how we do these things in academia is not consistent and not coherent at all. So I have seen a lot more people using things like model cards or defining their data sets and including um, basically a risk management sheet with their models so that people know what these models can and can't be used for, and I think that that's good. But I do think that we have a pretty long way to go in terms of standardizing this issue and like how we standardize that in the first place, because as I've talked about on the channel before, we don't have a good definition of fairness. And so any standard is going to standardize that definition in some way. And I think that finding a consensus on that is going to be very hard. Next up, hi Jordan, we were the same year in undergrad. I went to Cornell. I don't think we ever met in person, but we were Facebook friends for quite a few years before I deleted mine. Good for you, I probably should too. I just wanted to say that I'm really happy to see all of your success, thank you. How do you think that language models will develop in the coming years? Will we continue to see exponential like gains? Will these models ever do or replace knowledge work? Oh gosh, this is a really good question. And it's also a question that I've honestly kind of been avoiding. Um, not the question itself, but because there's been so many new releases when it comes to large language models f over the last like six months, it's honestly just been really hard to keep up with. And I also felt like, it felt like every video I was making on the channel was about large language models. And like, that's not really the point of this channel. And that's not the thing that I necessarily want to focus on. So in case you've been wondering why I haven't made like a chat GPT video or something else, that's probably why. I think it's also because it takes, you know, a few days at least for me to turn around a video. And so if something comes out on Monday and I start making the video, especially in the last six months, something else has come out by like Wednesday and now I need to make a new video. And so it became very hard to cover. In terms of how I think they're going to develop in the coming years, I think we're hitting, I guess I would say an interesting point with language models as it relates to them being deployed to the public because I feel like up until now, up until like things like ChatGPT and other language model based knowledge work assistance programs, we haven't really seen them proliferate on this level yet. And so I, I don't know that we'll continue to see exponential like gains. I think that we'll see, like a lot of what we've seen recently isn't really an exponential gain in terms of training transformers for even longer. It's more of people trying new strategies for creating human realistic generative text. And so I think we'll continue to see people try different things when it comes to especially fact checking. That's been a big issue lately. These language models are producing text that may or may not be true. I think we'll see a bunch of different approaches to that. And I think that that's, that's what I'm interested in seeing over the next year or so. In terms of whether or not they do or replace knowledge work, I think a lot of that will come down to two things. One is cost. So if it is reasonably cheaper and more accessible to use large language models and get the same quality of work as you'd get from, say, a freelancer on Upwork who works in the Philippines, I think that that could be compelling. I also do think that the actually maybe three things. <laughs> the second thing I think is just the, the 
Concerns around fact checking, and that's a concern that you have when people write articles, but then at least you can blame it on that person if they got something wrong, as opposed to if you have an AI, you kind of waive all liability in that case. So I think that will be that will definitely be an issue. I'd love to hear your thoughts on personalized medicine. Could the biases that inherently come with AI and thus personalized medicine be addressed through regulations? I think the short answer is that's definitely something that can be kept in mind when it comes to developing and approving this kind of stuff. Having said that, there was actually a paper that came out recently, I'll have to dig it up, that was, that essentially highlighted the fact that a lot of um, personalized medicine or like AI and healthcare software tools that had been approved through the FDA didn't show like particularly great outcomes, it didn't show better outcomes than not using them for the most part. And so I think that there is a real question on whether the tools that people are looking to transition to the healthcare system are actually useful in a widespread way. And I don't fully know that we've answered that question yet. I think that there have been a few select cases where they have been. Things like drug discovery is definitely one of them, but especially as it relates to personalized medicine, I think that's still very up in the air. Fellow ADHD are here, I want to ask if you could share any tips or advice that works for you when you want to get out of a slump. Oh gosh. The first thing I usually do <laughs> is stop working and go for a walk. Usually the issue that I run into if I am in a slump and I'm looking at a long list of incomplete tasks and I'm feeling overwhelmed is just to like take some time away from that. Even if it's like 10 minutes, like a walk around the block, something like that. Because I do find that a little bit of distance from it and just getting out of my head a little bit often helps a lot. After that, I usually basically triage. So I figure out what needs to be done. So for example, today, this video is technically late and I needed to film it. And so that's why I'm filming it right now. So that is something that I need to do. There's a long list of other things that are also in my to-do list, but they don't need to be done now. So this is what I'm doing. So I think that that often helps. And then I think the other thing that I do is just lower the bar a lot. I was reading, I can't remember what book it was. I think it was a Brianna Weiss book. In the book, someone made the point that you should do your best every day, but what your best looks like every day is gonna differ. It is um, based on, you know, how many spoons you have, how much energy you have, what your headspace is like. And so I, I try to gauge where I'm at in that moment and figure out like, what can I reasonably do? And then put that on the list. It's usually one or two things most and check that off and then use the fact that I've gotten those things done as motivation and reinforcement of the idea that I can actually get the rest done. I also find co-working helps with this a little bit just to have other people around you who are also working who may or may not be getting everything done on their to-do list. I host co-working sessions on Full Club. If you want to co co-work with me, I'll leave a link in the description. But that's how I usually approach that. Hope that helps. Could we use AGI to produce new storage solutions, for example, better compression algorithms? That's already an active area of research. I think it's super interesting. And yeah, I mean, I think the answer is yes. And if you want, I don't know if I do a whole video on that because like, that's a very niche topic, but if you'd like to hear more about that, you can let me know in the comments. Oh, also, if there are other videos you want to see this year, definitely let me know. Is there any chance of being an AI specialist without an academic method, so via self-education? I think it depends a lot on what you mean by AI specialist. There are definitely places that hire people who don't necessarily have like a PhD in computer science, but past that, yeah, it would depend a lot on what you mean by specialist. What will be the role of AI in climate change? So this is a, a theme that I'm planning on exploring a lot this year on the channel. It's something that I've been interested in getting into and just haven't gotten around to. And I think there's two sides. I've made videos on this before talking about how training models um, is often not very environmentally friendly, although a lot of companies, especially in industry, have improved on this front. I also think that there's a lot of interesting work on using algorithms to optimize energy storage, energy usage across energy grids in cities, to predict things like climate change related weather events that might cause especially natural disasters, so things like hurricanes and tornadoes. And I think that there will be a lot of really interesting work when it comes to 
ideally predicting the effects of climate change on our environments, as well as using those predictions to develop systems that can either reduce that harm before it happens or can help communities manage that harm in a way that is accessible to them. Someone wants to know if I'm single. I am. I'm also not really dating, so don't come for me in the comments. And our last question is AGI when? <laughs> There's two parts to this answer. One, I'm still in the boat of people who are skeptical of the concept of AGI. And the reason for that is part two, which is that as someone who works on the neuro side of things, we don't have a consistent definition of like human intelligence or intelligence in general. And so the idea of an algorithm that is generally intelligent, that is intelligent the way the human is, like I don't, I don't know what that would mean. I don't know how we would define that. I don't know what bar that would have to pass. I think you run into AI effect related issues. I have a video on that that I can link up here if you want to hear more about that. But I, I don't, I don't even know what we're aiming to hit other than a sci-fi version of some super intelligent sentient algorithm that can take over the entire world like an iRobot. And I don't think that that's going to happen and past that, I, I think that it's, it's such an ill-defined concept that it's not something that I worry about a lot, especially since there are lots of other ways that AI is um, having positive and negative impacts on our world today. So thanks for sending in all of your questions. If there are video topics that you want me to cover in 2023, definitely leave them in the comments. I have a few ideas on what I think I'm going to focus on uh, this year, but I would love to hear what you guys want to learn about and hear about, whether it be grad life related, PhD related, neurodivergence related, AI related, whatever. Um, and otherwise, thanks for another great year on the channel, even though I'm posting this video late. It's already 2023. As someone who spends a lot of time editing and uploading videos on the go, this past six months has been a lot of travel and I've been doing a lot of uploading things in airports. And using NordVPN has made me feel safer and more secure in my extensive use of public Wi-Fi. Thanks again to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. NordVPN is an all-in-one solution for your online security needs that gives you privacy on the go, whether that be your laptop, tablet, or smartphone. It's super easy to use, so you can connect in one click or enable auto-connect for zero-click protection. Plus, NordVPN has over 5,600 servers in 59 countries. In fact, I used to use NordVPN to watch uh, Shows that were not available in the US at the time, but were streaming in other countries, and you can take from that what you will. So whether you need an extra layer of security or you just want to catch up on your favorite TV show, you can sign up for a two-year NordVPN plan with four additional months free at nordvpn.com slash jordanherrod. And it's risk-free, so if you don't like it, you should definitely take advantage of their 30-day money-back guarantee. Otherwise, Happy New Year. It's 2023. I am looking forward to the next year of this channel. I am so thankful for all of you who have been part of this journey so far, and I'm looking forward to chatting with you guys over the next year. See ya!